Hey everyone and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have six stories coming out to a little bit over two hours. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's aim for 1200 likes. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated as I post content just like this all of the time. Also, tonight's video is a collaboration with my good friend Southern Cannibal. Be sure to check out his channel if you enjoy his parts. I will have him linked in the description as well as the pinned comment. Enjoy the video, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I'm writing this using voice to text while I drive myself back to my house. I'm sorry if this sounds rambling or like it doesn't make sense, but I don't know what else to do. I don't know if anyone will ever read this, but I just felt like I had to do it. Maybe for me. Maybe for someone else out there. Maybe for no one. I don't know. I woke up this morning from one of those weird half and half dreams where everything seems almost exactly like real life, except that it feels just a little bit, I guess off. I think everyone has had those and understands what I mean. I know I've had them a lot and it's always a little disorienting to wake up from one. Only this time I woke up fully alert and ready for the day. True, I knew I had to go to work, but after the weekend I just had, I was more than ready to put my focus on emails and unruly customers. It hadn't been horrible, just tense and uncomfortable. With my wife and I finding seemingly every way to get on each other's nerves, we possibly could. The night before had ended with me putting our five-year-old daughter, Christine, to bed like normal, and then going to bed early myself, mainly to avoid any more bickering. So, needless to say, I wasn't exactly sorry to be getting ready to head off to work. I hoped some time apart focusing on other things would help us both calm down and we could talk. Other than my dream and my greater than usual morning energy, it was a normal start to the day. Grab clothes and toss them in the dryer so they're warm and soft. Hop into the shower for a few minutes. Shave, dry, and style my hair. Which honestly doesn't take that long, though given the complaints I get about it sometimes you'd think I was in there for hours. Get dressed, check my phone, etc. Normal stuff. Even if I had to hunt for my shampoo and then my razor since they weren't in my usual spots. There was an all-staff email from my boss Brian that he sent late Friday evening, and I groaned reading it. Because it was about an all-staff meeting that he wanted to have to go over a few things. Which never amounts to anything good or productive. I must have gotten caught up in my thoughts longer than I realized because the next thing I knew, it was a few minutes past time for me to be walking out the door. I jumped up and grabbed my keys and wallet and headed towards the door. When I walked past Christine's room, I noticed that her door was shut. It was odd because normally at that time of the morning she'd be playing with her toys or helping. My wife cook in the kitchen. I knocked on the door so we could have our usual goodbye kisses and squeezes and tickles, but all that happened was her yelling, go away, leave me alone, at me through the door. I tried to open the door, but it was locked, which she knew was against the rules. We had told her numerous times to not lock the door because we couldn't get in there if she needed us. I yelled for her to come unlock it, but she didn't respond anymore, though I could hear her moving around and crying. I checked my phone and saw I was really late, so I called to my wife in the kitchen. Honey, Christine's locked herself in the room. Can you go find out what's wrong? I'm late leaving today. I'll call later. Love you. She didn't say anything, just turned and stared at me with a blank look on her face. I chalked it up to her not being over our last fight from the night before. Started by me evidently loading the dishwasher incorrectly, and so she was giving me the silent treatment. Honestly, I didn't have time to think about it, but I felt sure there would be a talk later. I saw her turn towards Christine's room as I turned to shut the door behind me. So I figured she had at least heard me, and would make sure our daughter was okay. I hopped in the car, started it up, and pulled out of the drive. 
We live out in the country and I still had at least a 45 minute drive ahead of me to traffic if it wasn't too bad. So I figured I would have plenty of time to mentally adjust to work mode. The route takes me by one of my wife's relative's houses, an older aunt who still works out in her yard almost every morning. On a day when I leave in enough time, I can stop and talk for a minute and check in, but when I'm late, I'll slow down and blow the horn and wave. I saw her out front as usual, so I did, even rolling down the window to yell good morning as I rolled past. She stood up and turned to look at me. She didn't wave back or say anything. Her face, it was expressionless. She just stared at me as I drove past, not reacting, not blinking, just staring. I couldn't figure out any reason she wouldn't have returned my greeting. Unless maybe she had been outside for too long and was feeling a little sun-dazed. But soon enough, I was past her and had my eyes back on the road. It wasn't until I was down the road a little, right before a curve, that I happened to glance in my rearview mirror and noticed that she was standing in the middle of the road. It was such a shock, so unexpected a thing to see, that I slammed on my brakes bringing the car to a sudden stop. My first thought was that something was wrong as she needed help or was trying to get my attention for some reason. But the longer I sat there thinking about it, the more I felt sure that she was doing what she had been doing before, staring at me with that same blank look, that same expressionless face as she had when I drove by. I tried to tell myself I was being silly, that I needed to go back and check on her, when I noticed that she had started to move. Not back towards her house, but down the road, towards me. I still can't explain the thrill of fear that shot down my spine, but the next thing I remember was flying down the road away from her, going much, much faster than I should have been on those winding country roads. I knew I should slow down, but the thought of her getting closer to me, maybe even catching up to me, had my foot all the way down on the accelerator. I didn't see anyone else outside, which wasn't unusual, until I got to the end of the road where it turns into the bigger road into town. An old man lives there, and he sometimes will be outside with a whole pack of dogs, letting them play out in his yard. He's always friendly, and will wave or at least nod at people driving by. He was outside this time, sitting on a stump, but no dogs. Not even one. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when I got there, and I dreaded to see if he reacted the same way my wife's aunt did. At first, he didn't seem to notice me, but then I guess the change in sound as I slowed down alerted him to my presence because he stood, turned to me, and stared with the same look I had seen on two other faces already this morning. I fought not to react, to act like nothing was wrong, to tell myself that I was just imagining things, that everything was normal. I stopped long enough to make sure there was no traffic coming and pulled onto the bigger road, glancing behind me as I did. I almost wrecked the car when I saw him walk out into the road and start to slowly make his way towards me. That same look on his face. I punched the accelerator again and took off, not able to pretend that I was okay anymore. I drove a little down the road, my head whipping back and forth watching for anybody who might be out in their yard or walking along the side of the road. But I didn't see anyone. Not far from the turn into the road is a little gas station that has really good breakfast, as well as gas. And though I was late and didn't need gas or plan on eating, I slowed and pulled in. I had to. I had to know. There weren't many people there, just a few good old boys who stopped nearly every morning for coffee and a biscuit, plus a couple of people to run the store. But at the sound of my car pulling in, every face turned as one to look right at me. Every face was that same blank, vacant stare. The one sitting slowly stood, and my pulse started racing as I flicked my eyes from face to face searching for anything other than that blankness. 
When the first one started towards me as I hit the gas again and fishtailed out into the road, my eyes locked on the rearview mirror, watching as they all slowly walked out into the road and moved after me. Farther off in the distance, I could just see the old man from the corner still making his way towards me, and my imagination supplied a mental image of my wife's aunt doing the same thing somewhere even farther back. By this point, my attention was half on the road in front of me, and half behind me, watching the people from the gas station get further away. It was right about then that I encountered the first vehicle on the road since I had left the house. A regular truck, nothing fancy, nothing out of the ordinary, but as I passed by it I ducked down, hoping to avoid being seen. Out of the corner of my eye I thought I saw the driver's head turn towards me, and a moment later I checked my mirror and saw the truck backing up off the road, turning around and coming towards me. I admit at that point I panicked for a minute and almost lost control of the car as the speedometer shot over 90, but when I glanced back the truck was still behind me. I slowed to avoid an accident and it kept on following me closely. I could see the driver in the rear view and I shivered at the by now familiar blank stare on his face. I decided there wasn't anything to do except continue on toward town hoping that maybe whatever was going on was isolated to the countryside and I could find some help and some answers. As I got closer to town, there was more and more traffic turning onto the road or coming the other way. And every time, every single time, they passed by me, stopped, turned, and got into the line behind me. I don't know how many cars and trucks and SUVs and motorcycles ended up behind me, but they stretched out as far back as I could see. I was barely watching the road now, my nerves jumpy, eyes scanning the roadside and behind me, fighting to keep myself together. I'm not entirely sure I succeeded. When I got into town, I saw more people, gas stations, fast food places, Standing outside their homes, every single damn one of them turned and watched me as I drove past. Slower now, cautious, trying to avoid hitting anyone or anything. They couldn't follow me into the road because of all the vehicles, so they started down the side of the road slowly. Slower than the cars and trucks, but always, always coming for me. No change of expression, no reaction to anything else going on. Hell, not even any noise, just those blank, empty faces watching me, following me, hunting me. As I drove further and further in, closer to my work, I began to realize something. I hadn't seen anyone else who was like me, who seemed normal. Everyone I had encountered, every single one of them had been like the ones behind me were part of the ones behind me. There wasn't going to be anyone at work who could help me. I thought about going to the police station, but knew instinctively that would be useless. It would just be that blank-faced, expressionless people following me. Not any help. There was nobody else but me. Nobody. Then I remembered. I remembered my daughter. I remembered Christine yelling at me to go away, to leave her alone. She was the only one I had talked to, the only one who responded to me. I thought about how perceptive she is, how sensitive to change she is, and how even slight differences in behavior would upset her. She must have known, she must have sensed somehow. Then I thought about my wife. I thought about the blank look on her face when she had turned to me. Christine must have seen her mother before I got up, must have known, and then I thought about my comment to my wife about Christine being in her room, how my wife's head had turned that way as I was leaving, almost as if she had remembered there was someone else still in the house. I'm on my way back home. I've been driving as fast as I can, picking my way around the people or whatever they are still walking down the road towards me. 
I turned around in a parking lot and watched as every single vehicle followed me turn two. I was able to get ahead of them for a while because of how long it took, but now they're back on my tail. I've encountered some of the very first ones I saw this morning. I passed my wife's aunt a ways back there and tried not to look. Tried not to see her turn and follow me like all the rest. I have to get home. I have to get home. Get Christine and get us both somewhere safe. If anywhere is anymore, I'm about to pull into the driveway. and I won't have much time. I'll park on the street so they hopefully can't block me in. I can see Christine's shadow at the window, but I can't see her face. I don't know what I'll do about my wife or any of the things following me. I don't know what I'll do if Christine looks at me with a blank, vacant stare like her mother. I just have to hope. I have to pray. I'm sending this out to all the contacts in my phone just in case. I'll post it online once I'm safe and back in my car with my daughter. Wish me luck. I'll message again soon. I hope. I never really knew how scary it was to have a stalker. I was 18 years old back then, and despite this being four years ago, it's still really fresh in my mind to this day. I was in my first year of college, and my girlfriend had just broken up with me. I was devastated. I texted her several times, but she never responded. I also tried calling her, but I just always went to voicemail. All I wanted to do was work things out with her, but she would never contact me or ever pick up any of my calls. My brother, who was 27 at the time, told me to just try and forget about her and that I needed to move on. He told me to try online dating. I wasn't really a fan of online dating because I've just seen a lot of catfishing stories, but I thought of it for a while and I decided to give it a chance. I downloaded the app Tinder and then set up a profile. After I was done, I waited for somebody to message me. I probably waited for about a day and not a single person messaged me. I was getting ready to log out of my account when, strangely, right at the perfect moment somebody messaged me. The message said, Hey, what's up? So I responded, mm, Not too much. What about you? As I waited for the next message, I looked at her profile. Now, for the sake of privacy reasons, let's refer to her as Lily. Lily had blonde hair and beautiful blue eyes. And I saw that we lived not too far away from each other. My first immediate thought was, wow, this beautiful girl just messaged me. And right as I was thinking that, another message came through. The message said, you look really handsome. Want to hang out sometime? So I responded back with, I'd love to hang out. And after I sent that message, she then texted me back immediately, then saying, Okay, when do you want to hang out? I asked her when she was free, and she told me tomorrow. We then agreed to meet up tomorrow, but we were trying to decide on where we wanted to meet up at. Hmm, maybe we should meet at the coffee shop that's nearby in the morning, she said. I responded back telling her okay, and that it sounds good, and that I'd see her tomorrow. The conversation then ended after that. I went to bed feeling like I was really on top of the world. The next morning I got ready and I drove down to the coffee shop. I sent her a text saying that I was at the shop and she replied back with, Okay, I'm just one minute away. I responded back with just a simple okay and then waited and then got a table. She ended up arriving not too long later and we honestly had a really good time. It turned out that we actually had a lot in common. We both liked video games, road trips, etc. As we finished our date, we said our goodbyes, and as I got home, I already had another message from her saying that she already missed me. Our next date was in three days, and on the day of our second date, I got ready and drove to our meeting place. Right away, she started to act, I don't know, different. Not mean, but just really different, almost embarrassed. I asked her what was wrong, and she responded with nothing. After our date was over, we said our goodbyes again, and we both went home. I immediately got a call from her, and it was her being super insistent, saying that she wanted to give me a gift on our next date. 
weird, but I said, okay, sounds good, then hung up. She then immediately called me right after I hung up, then saying, why did you hang up on me? I then replied back saying that I thought she was done talking and I didn't think she wanted to tell me anything else. She then went on to ask me to stay on the phone with her all night long. I told her I was sorry but I really can't do that because I have classes tomorrow. But she just ignored what I said and just started to talk and she then started to ask me some questions about life. I answered all the questions and I told her it was getting really late and that I needed to get to bed but she just kept refusing to let me hang up. She was being really insistent that I stayed up late talking to her all throughout the night. I was getting really drowsy, and before I knew it, I then passed out on my bed. I had like a hundred messages from her the next morning, saying things like, Um, hello, why aren't you responding to me? But the one that really stood out to me the most was the one where she said she was going to break into my house and kill me if I didn't respond back. I muttered the words, What the fuck? So yeah, I figured it was the time to break up with her. Well, this is when all the stalking began. She moved into an apartment complex closer to mine, and she even dropped out of her college so she could go to mine. She would always walk about five to six feet behind me wherever I went, and she wouldn't even go to class. She would just stand outside the door, staring at me, with really cold and blank eyes. I wasn't a very intimidating person, nor do I look intimidating. So, I knew if I told Lily to stop following me, she probably wouldn't listen. It began to progress where she would stand outside my apartment with her face pressed up against my front door. Every time I would look out to the peephole, I would see one of her eyes staring at me as if she was trying to look inside my apartment. And one time she even tried to break into my apartment. I called the police several times but they said they couldn't really do anything without any evidence. And if she's not actually in my apartment, they really couldn't do anything about it. So they just told me to let them know if anything else happens. This is when I decided to get a restraining order. So the following next week, I finally filed for the restraining order. But this didn't help anything. She still continued to follow me and she even tried to tackle me once. I was absolutely done at this point. So I called the cops saying that I wanted her arrested. I told them that she wasn't agreeing to follow the restraining order. While I was on the phone with the cops... I was getting a phone call from another number. I told the cops to hold on, and I picked it up. It was Lily, and she was saying some really fucked up things in a demented voice. If I can't have you, nobody can. And I then yelled back at her. I told her if she doesn't stop following me, she's going to be arrested. Well, shortly after the phone call, Lily showed up to my apartment standing with a big ass knife. Make fun of me all you want. I know I'm a guy but I actually started to choke and scream as I stared at Lily. She had wild ass hair, had bloodshot eyes, and there was actual frost coming out of her mouth. It also looked like she hadn't showered in days. She yelled that same psychotic phrase yet again. If I can't have you, nobody can. She then ran right for me with the knife still in her hand. I was able to dodge her, but she still managed to slip my cheek. I ran to another room and locked the door, calling the police and telling them what happened. Lily was going crazy. She was stabbing the door with a knife and saying all kinds of more psychotic things. Lo and behold though, within about 10 minutes, the police had finally arrived. They tackled Lily to the ground and I exited the room. As they took Lily away, I could see nothing but hatred in her eyes. Lily was screaming at me. I just want you to know whenever I get out of here, I'm going to fucking kill you. There ended up being a trial and Lily got put away for a while. She was charged with breaking and entering and attempted murder. As you can imagine, after this experience, I totally quit dating apps altogether. I recently called the police to try and get an update on Lily and they told me she's in really bad shape. She's still obsessed with me and she even has a journal of ways to kidnap and murder me. After that call, I ended up moving to another state far, far away from Lily. I just hope that when she's released, she doesn't do this to another person. So to Lily, my obsessive ex-girlfriend. Hopefully I never see you again for the rest of my life.
My buddies and I never graduated high school. None of us really took school as seriously as we should have. Throughout our years, we stayed in detention and the principal's office. We weren't bad kids or troublemakers or anything like that, but we often goofed around and got a kick out of being the class clowns. As a result of that, we rarely got any work done, scraping by doing just the bare minimum. By the time we made it to 10th grade, all three of us decided to drop out one by one. Now that I'm in my early 20s, not much has changed. I've been working various dead-end jobs ever since leaving high school. I worked at a local burger joint as a cashier, apart from my friends, Chris and Mike. Chris worked as a janitor at a supermarket, while Mark was an associate at a movie theater on the other side of town. Living in an area where the cost of housing was relatively high meant that we couldn't afford to pay the rent every month making just a little over minimum wage. So all three of us lived together in an apartment. Aside from our day jobs, we'd also engage in a few active miscellaneous side hustles to get some extra pocket change every now and then. Mostly Uber or DoorDash, but there was one side hustle we did occasionally, maybe twice a month. Often we'd sneak out to the cemetery and desecrate some graves. Mostly mausoleums because they were quick and easy to break into. Then depending on what was inside them, we'd go pawn the items and split the cash. Most of the time we didn't find anything worth pawning, but every blue moon we'd come across some corpse that would be buried with a piece of gold or some other kind of valuable item. We found out that an older woman had passed away. It was actually someone we often saw around town regularly. Caitlin Sanders was her name. She died at 64 years old. It wasn't someone we personally knew or spoke to at all, but it was someone we were very familiar with. We've been seeing her around for years, yet none of us knew her name until we found out she died. While she was alive, she worked as a real estate agent, helping clients buy and sell homes on the more luxurious side of town. Her occupation gave us the impression that she was at least somewhat wealthy and would most likely be buried with something we could definitely use. Caitlin was financially well, but she didn't live in the high-class neighborhoods she often did business in. Her home wasn't located too far from us. It was about seven or eight blocks away from our apartment. According to the few sources we found on the internet, Caitlin wasn't going to have a funeral service or a cemetery burial. Her sister was going to take ownership of the property, then bury Caitlin right in her own backyard. One night, all three of us went to Caitlin's house to find her grave. Her house was two stories tall, with many doors and windows. The yard was fairly large, containing lots of well-groomed shrubbery and small bushes. An iron gate, along with many trees, surrounded the yard. After climbing the gates, we searched the yard for a few minutes until we came across a small house-like structure sitting towards the backyard. I clicked on my flashlight and shined it on the building as we got close. The mini house-like structure had double doors and two Doric columns going down both sides. A short chain and lock bound the two doors together. The material on the small house looked like it was marble, as it was covered in swirly patterns. The entire thing resembled that of a classical Rome building. I shined my light towards the top, then we saw Caitlin's full name carved across the roof. Chris pulled a pair of bolt cutters from his utility bag before breaking the lock. Then we pulled the two marble doors open as they scraped the concrete ground below. At first we stared at nothing but darkness inside. Dust floated amidst the beams of our flashlights as we shined them around. Then we saw that the walls had strange symbols carved into them. Now what the hell is all this shit? Mike said, waving his light around. Most of the symbols were unrecognizable. There were a few simple shapes of animals here and there. Birds, snakes, along with a few bull or cow-like creatures. I also saw some outlines of stylistic eyes, but the symbol that stood out the most was one of the two human arms. 
They were connected, forming a U-shape containing two intertwined snakes between them. The symbol was the largest, being emphasized over everything else. The eye symbols looked slightly familiar to me. I've seen it being referenced numerous times in pop culture, but at that moment I couldn't think of it. The eye of horror. Although it was at the tip of my tongue, I didn't stand a chance. Our flashlights all came together to spot a burial vault sitting in the middle of the pitch black room. The vault had a metal cage with space bars on the front, allowing us to see one side of a casket lying in there. Chris cut the bars using his bolt cutters, then pried them back with a crowbar. Afterwards, Mike and I helped Chris slide the very heavy casket out. Chris used the crowbar to pop the lids open. I squinted and mentally braced myself. Because although we've been doing this for a decent amount of time, I still wasn't quite used to personally seeing corpses just yet. We all pointed our flashlights inside the casket. Then we saw her. Hell yeah. Fucking jackpot. Mike's son. Caitlin's slightly rotting body was lying inside, her overlapped hands resting on her stomach. Her face was riddled with a few black spots here and there from the gangrene slowly eating away at her. Other than the small rotting areas on her body, she looked almost the same. She was dressed in her usual businesswoman's suit and skirt, a uniform we often saw her wearing when she was living. What had caused Mike's outbursts was the sight of all the jewelry Caitlin was wearing. The gold tattering her fingers and neck were nearly enough to distract us from her body. She had three gold rings on the rotting fingers of each of her hands, while her wrists held several gold bracelets. Around her neck was an oddly shaped necklace. It was just a golden wedge with a thin string attached that looped around her neck. Mike reached forward and removed one of her rings. A slight cracking sound came from Caitlin's dead and cold finger. I took about two rings off her fingers, then placed them on mine, observing them up close. The frequent dents and nicks around the edges of the rings, along with the asymmetric round shapes, gave me the impression that they were old. I took them off again and searched for small diamonds or gems. There weren't any. Chris stared into the casket for a minute before finally deciding to go for the bracelets around her wrists. He stopped before touching them, then turned to me. Uh, Kenny, you mind grabbing those? Chris asked. He still didn't like touching the bodies. I slid some of the bracelets off Caitlin's wrist, then handed them to Chris. He looked at them in the palm of his hands for a second before stuffing them into his bag. With most of the rings still on my fingers, I removed the peculiar necklace from around her neck and placed it in my pocket. Mike and I grabbed a few more of the rings, then I handed Chris the rest of the bracelets. After closing the casket and shoving it back into the vault, Chris drew a spare chain and replaced the one he broke on the door. We left excited, thinking that we found was just another luck haul. The next day we took the jewelry to a pawn shop that was owned by a guy we had known for many years. His name was Jerry, and we met him months after leaving school. Jerry was an older guy in his 50s, and he's been running that pawn shop for about a decade. He often got decent business there, too. Being struggling dropouts and all, we often went there to pawn everything we came across, trying to get a hold of every dime possible. Jerry was always willing to lend a helping hand to us. He made sure he gave us the best deals and bargains. Every now and then... Just one good bargain with Jerry meant having our share of the rent paid off for the month, or getting a saving stash started. When we walked in the pawn shop, Jerry was posted behind the counter. He smirked when he saw us. What you rascals dug up now? Jerry's son. He's known about our side hustle for a while. Months after we started, we told him about it. Then, strangely enough, he shrugged it off and laughed. I don't care how the hell you bring me the money, as long as I get it. I remembered him spewing out while chuckling hysterically. All three of us approached the counter, 
right away pulling out our shares of the gold jewelry and sitting it on top. Jerry's eyes widened, filling with delight. God damn, where the hell did you boys find this? Jerry said, picking up one of the bracelets and observing it. Jerry grabbed his portable magnifying glass dangling from the silver pocket chain on his waist before getting an even closer look at the jewelry. Then he took the jewelry to the back to weigh the grams. Turns out Mike was right. We did hit the jackpot indeed. The jewelry was of 14 karat gold. Altogether it weighed in at 226 grams, which is 8 ounces. Jerry said that was a stash worth almost $10,000. It was the biggest piece of treasure we found yet, along with the biggest break in terms of living. After minutes of negotiation and compromise, we managed to walk out with $3,000 in total. We each got $1,000 after splitting the cash. It felt good to still have some extra money left over after paying my dues. It's been a while since I've been able to save a decent amount in my bank account without having to worry about giving it up on some kind of never-ending necessity. That might have been the biggest and only head start I was going to get for a while, so I tried to make it last. Mike has always spent the majority of his disposable income on women. That month was no different. Despite being a low-income worker with no ambition and barely a place to stay, Mike was a ladies' man by nature. He often hooked up with lots of different women and engaged in many short-term relationships. Chris bought a cheap video camera for under $100, as he wanted to start a YouTube channel. He had a thing for firearms and planned on creating gun review videos. He already had a small collection of pistols in his room, and a few shotguns, something that was only possible because of good old Jerry. Over time, we started to experience strange physical symptoms. I felt some pain in my chest area. Then eventually my entire body started aching. It started out small and minor during the first few days, but it got so bad I could barely get out of bed without cringing in agony. At first I thought it was just me, until Chris and Mike said they were also feeling a bit weird. Chris complained of a constant throbbing pain in his jaw, which eventually shot across his entire mandible. Mike, on the other hand, experienced some mean headaches. Those headaches turned into a severe fever, and it made Mike's face turn almost a beat run. He had to take off from work for almost two weeks because of it. The strange symptoms soon faded, but it wasn't over yet. Nightmares started to plague our sleep. The first one to get a taste of this was Chris. Mike and I were shot wide awake by screaming in the middle of the night. That was followed by Chris screaming and crying. I hopped out of bed and rushed to Chris's room. When I got there, Mike was already standing over him, shaking him hard while Chris wriggled around and wildly threw his limbs. I joined Mike in shaking Chris and trying to get him awake. Chris, I shouted. After a minute, he woke up, hyperventilating with sweat covering his face. He started gazing around the room in confusion. Chris said he dreamt of a man following him in the dark. He wasn't sure where he was, but there was nothing but darkness around him. The man looked lifeless, like a corpse. His face lacked any emotion, and his skin was so dead to the point of resembling a dark gray color. But what he noticed first was his eyes. They were as black as the darkness that surrounded them. Chris suddenly found himself sprawled across the floor while being repeatedly stomped in the face by the strange man particularly in his jaw. This continued for a few nights. Chris would wake up from his screams and cries for help throughout the night. Then Mike and I would run into his room and shake him awake. Chris would dream about that same corpse-like man, attacking him in that same manner every time. It was only a matter of time until Mike and I got the same experience. Just like Chris, I would dream about a man chasing me every night. It was chilling to see that man in my dreams looked exactly the way Chris described him. Very dead looking with gray skin and jet black eyes. When I wasn't running from the man, my limbs were being broken by him. 
He was using his bare hands, just bending and popping my arms and legs in very unnatural angles as I screeched away in the darkness. While Chris was at work one day, Mike revealed that he was having dreams too. Of the same man, he told me he kept seeing a dead man visiting him. The way the man chose to torment Mike, however, was just slightly more weird than what Chris and I experienced. The man would crawl on top of Mike, pinning him down with one hand before bashing him in the face with a rock. Mike always woke up after being struck the first time. I didn't know what to think after that. Mike and I thought it was strange that we were dreaming of the same man every night. We didn't have a clue how that could even happen or why it was happening. Chris and I were in the apartment alone. Mike had run off on a date with another one of his women and planned on being gone for the rest of the night. He told us he was going to stay the night at the woman's house and should be back the next day around noon. I was on the first floor of our apartment building, on the porch smoking a cigarette while scrolling away on my phone. Chris sat up in his room cleaning his guns and setting up the new camera he bought as he planned on recording his first video. While taking multiple drags of my cigarettes, I hear Chris scream, followed by a loud bang. I jumped, dropping my cigarette. Chris? I shouted. I rushed up to our apartment and swung the door wide open, starting for Chris's room, but before I stepped in, all the lights went out, leaving the entire apartment nearly pitch black. The only sources of light in the room were the lit numbers on the microwave and the oven in the kitchen along with the slight amount of moonlight shining in through the windows in the dining room area. Chris, what happened? I shouted again. No answer. Chris? I said. Still, nothing. I accidentally rammed my leg against the table as I couldn't see where I was going, so I turned on the light on my phone to help me see my way around the blackness. I reached Chris's room and shined my phone's light around until I spotted him standing in front of his open closet, back facing me. His arms dangled down at his sides. He just stood there, standing stiff and not making any movements or sounds. Chris? I said. He wouldn't respond to anything I was saying, so I reached forward and gently spun him around using one hand. I screamed when I saw his face, then started backing away with my hand over my mouth. Chris's bottom jaw had been ripped away. His tongue dangled down and moved from side to side over his exposed throat. Most of his top teeth were missing, leaving nothing but destroyed gums behind. I shined the light to the floor and discovered his jaw lying in the middle of a mini blood pool. He reached out and tried to grab me, but I backed away. Shocked as I shine my light on his grotesque face. Who, who did this to you? I stammered. He couldn't answer. Chris dropped to the floor. I was about to run out of the room, but I was stopped by something blocking me. My light was beaming on someone's body, and it looked like they were clothed in a dark gray coverall. As I slowly moved my light up to the mystery person's chest, I saw that whoever was standing in front of me was holding one of Chris's shotguns in their hands. My jaws dropped when I shined my light in their face. It was a man, and he had gray skin, jet black eyes, and an emotionless expression. Who the fuck are you? I said. He didn't answer. He cocked the shotgun then aimed it right at my face. I tackled him to the ground and tried to take the shotgun away from him, but before he could shoot. But the man was incredibly strong. After failing to disarm him, I just got up and ran out of the apartment, leaving the man on the floor and not bothering to close the door behind me. When I got back on the first floor again, I dashed across the parking lot and approached my car. I tried to open the door, but it was locked, and I just realized I didn't have my keys with me. I gazed back and saw the man creeping towards me, shotgun still in hand. He raised the gun, then fired, 
missing me but shattering the window on the passenger side of my car. My alarm went off instantly, echoing out into the night. I realized I had dropped my cell phone. It was lying on the ground face down behind the man. There was no way I was getting that back without being blown away. I spun back around and just sprinted out of the parking lot as multiple gunshots went off behind me. I decided to go visit Mike and his current girlfriend a few blocks away. I had to tell Mike what happened. Plus, I needed to use their phone to call the police. I searched for the address Mike had told Chris and I he'd been to earlier. Then I spotted a small house with a white car sitting in the driveway. I couldn't remember the exact number of the residence, but I did know the street, and I thought that was the house Mike was pointing to before. I really hoped that was the right one. Rushing to the door, I immediately started knocking multiple times while constantly glancing behind me. The black-eyed man followed me halfway there, and I barely lost him, so I was still on the lookout. After seconds, there still wasn't anyone answering the door, so I knocked again. Mike, I said. Please, it's me, Kenny. Low sounds of someone crying is what I got instead. Then the crying grew louder. It sounded feminine, like a girl. Had to be Mike's girlfriend. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. Just more crying. I stepped back and rammed into the door, busting it open. As soon as I stepped in, I heard a scream occupied by multiple wet thumping noises. The entire house was a bit dark, so I flipped a light switch nearby on the wall. The power was out there, too. Mike? I said. The sounds of crying led me to a bedroom with a door that was wide open. A fluorescent blue light illuminated the room. I slowly made my way in careful not to dive into whatever may have been waiting. There was a young woman sitting in the corner of the room, balled up and hugging her knees. She was shaking uncontrollably, tears streaming down her face. The light had been coming from a small lantern sitting beside her. She let out a scream when she saw me walk in. I trotted over to her while shushing her repeatedly. Please stop, I said. Listen. I'm friends with Mike, and something terrible just happened to someone else we know. Now where is Mike? She started crying again when I asked that. Then she glanced over at the bed on the other side of the room. The sheets were stained with blood, and the walls had blood dripping down them. There was also a bulge between the sheets. I went over to the bed and yanked the sheets away, only to find Mike's battered face staring back at me. That's only if it could be called a face anymore. All there was was a mushy mix of blood and crunched bone in place of the face that was once able to recognize. One of the eyeballs dangled down the side of the crushed skull. My eyes filled with tears. Then I threw the sheet back over him again before turning back around. He, he killed him. She cried. Who killed him? I asked, tears running down my cheeks. She hesitated before answering. It was some guy with black eyes, she said. My heart dropped to my stomach when she said this. He came out of nowhere and attacked him. She cried. Well, why didn't you call the police? I asked. The power went out, and when he first came in, I threw my cell phone at him in a panic. Then he smashed my phone. I didn't hear him leave, so I've been scared to leave the room ever since. She explained. Her last sentence made me come to a chilling realization. He was still in the house. I was about to pull her out of the corner, but before I even took one step, that's when I saw him standing in the doorway. A man. Another man. This wasn't the same guy I was currently running from, but he was similar. He also had black eyes and gray skin. This man wore glasses and he was bald. Instead of a shotgun, he was holding a sledgehammer. The young woman screamed. Then the guy came trotting towards us, hammer raised in the air. He lunged and took a swing. 
He missed and instead drove the hammer into the wall behind me, knocking a huge hole into it. The young woman stood up and grabbed a curtain bar nearby before repeatedly hitting the man across his body. He didn't seem to have any reaction to being hit. He didn't look like he could feel pain at all. He turned and instantly laid her out cold with a whack across the head with his hammer. She fell to the ground, blood leaking from her split hand. I ran past him and rushed out of the house. After leaving the young woman's house, I didn't know where to go. I've tried waking up to a few houses and knocking on doors. As expected, no one answered. Couldn't really blame them. I wouldn't answer the door past midnight either. I could see Caitlin's house from a distance. I didn't realize I had run that far. As I was about to make my way past the gates, I was surprised to see an older woman standing behind them. I glanced her way, then kept running. But I stopped when I saw that she was gesturing for me to come to her. A wide grin spread across her face. Who was she? Had to be Caitlin's sister. I glanced behind me only to see the sledgehammer guy creeping towards me beneath a street light. Please come. I have something important to share with you. The old woman said on locking the gates and opening one of the doors. Her grin grew wider when she saw the man following me. Reluctantly, I did what she asked and went in. She slammed the gate shut, then secured both doors with a latch. She led me into the house. The first thing I saw is a spiral staircase that leads up to the second floor. There was an office with a burning fireplace to the left of us, and the living room was on the right. Two candles flickered away in the living room. One on a coffee table in the center of the room was a tea kettle and mug with a book sitting beside it. The other candle sat on a china cabinet near one of the windows. The woman went into the living room and sat on one of the sofas next to the coffee table. I followed, sitting down across from her. She still had that smile on her face. It was starting to creep me out, and I was beginning to regret my decision to follow her there. You boys have no idea what you've gotten yourselves into, she said. I didn't know what she was speaking of, but by the sound of it already, it didn't seem good. What? I said. She giggled. The jewelry. She replied. Trust me, there's a lot more to it than what meets the eye. I swallowed hard, eyes wide while staring back at her. I, I don't know what. Come on, son. I saw you guys do it. She interrupted. There was an awkward silence. I was going to call the police when I looked out my window and saw you guys breaking into my sister's tomb. But I figured you already had something better coming your way. She continued. She leaned forward and poured herself some tea before taking a sip. But it was nice of you to clean up after yourselves. She said. I could only sit there and stare. So, why did you bring me in here exactly? I asked, fidgeting. Grave robbery. She started, ignoring my question. Although it's relatively rare today, it was a huge problem hundreds and thousands of years ago, particularly during the ancient times in Egypt. She continued. You see, my sister and I just so happen to be related to an important figure in history that you may or may not have heard of. Are you familiar with any of the female pharaohs of ancient Egypt? I nodded my head no. I had some memories of Egyptian lectures in school, but I never paid attention long enough to absorb much information. Well, most pharaohs throughout history were men, but there were anywhere from 7 to 15 female pharaohs in Egypt, the most popular one being Hatshepsut, Cleopatra VII, and Nefertiti. It's widely believed that Sabek Neferu was the first amongst them all, but that's not true. The first woman to get any power of that kind was a long-lost descendant in our bloodline, 
Aziza, the woman explained. I really didn't know where she was going with this. Aziza was a very powerful pharaoh indeed. In fact, she was more powerful than Hatshepsut, who is believed to have been the most powerful Egyptian woman ruler ever. Although powerful, Ziza was a kind and merciful leader. She was well liked and respected by the people. Unlike most people throughout ancient Egyptian history, the poor under Ziza's rule were not limited to breed and bear when it came to staying fed. They got to enjoy the luxury of meat and wine, along with other foods that were typically reserved for the rich. Overall, Ziza had the poor living under much better conditions than what anyone would expect. But, despite Ziza's great treatment to the people, there were still many bad apples here and there. Like you guys. She said, pointing at me. I gave her a slight frown. I couldn't believe I was listening to this. Many become ungrateful and greedy. Then robbers started stealing jewelry and other valuable things from the resting pharaoh's tombs. After this went on for some time, Ziza became fed up with the dishonesty. So she put a spell on the items of the dead pharaohs and her own also. Oh, so voodoo then, I said sarcastically. No, not voodoo. In Egypt, they practice something called hika. She explained, opening the book on the table and revealing a familiar-looking symbol on one of the pages. Two connected human arms that formed a U with intertwined snakes in the middle. It was the largest symbol we saw in Caitlin's tomb. Hika was used for things like healing, getting rid of harmful poisons, and stripping people of harmful spirits. She replied. But it could also be used for more darker intentions such as punishment. Those who stole anything else from the tombs after the spell would face greater than dire consequences. The punishment for busted tomb robbers was death, but those who weren't caught would be in just as much trouble. Worse, actually. And exactly how? I asked. We heard a loud bang beside us, then turned to see the sledgehammer guy banging on the window outside with his fist. Staring in at us through the glass, the woman grinned once again, then continued talking. Raiders who thought they'd escape fate would be hunted down by forces, then killed severely, she said. This also goes for anyone else outside the pharaoh bloodline who unethically takes ownership of any of the cursed items. What forces? I asked. They come in many forms, she replied. They show up as people, animals, and many more. But before they come after the person, or the thief, the victim may start out with feeling minor physical ailments that would turn into horrific dreams at night. Then finally, she pointed to the sledgehammer guy still grinning. It took a moment to realize what she was trying to tell me. My eyes widened when I got the message. Are you saying we have this curse? I said. She nodded. You've been marked. What? I said, puzzled. I stood up and began pacing the floor in a panic. Then I took a quick glance at the guy standing outside. His face followed me as I moved back and forth. Well, I'm sure there's some way I can get rid of this, right? I said. I'm afraid not. The curse is permanent. The forces will pursue you for the rest of your life. Or until it kills you. She explained. Are you fucking kidding me? I shouted. There has to be some way I can get this off. There has to be. There isn't. However... If you still have the jewelry, or know where it is, I suggest you get at least a piece of it back. It's going to be the key to keeping your life. She's son. I turned and looked at her. How? How the hell is that going to help me now? I yelled. The jewelry is a suppressant to the forces. They'll follow you around, but they won't be able to harm you as long as you wear at least a piece of the jewelry. She explained. 
At that moment, I thought of someone else. Jerry. I wondered if he still had the jewelry in his pawn shop. The old woman chuckled. Then she started laughing maniacally. You're fucking crazy, lady. I shouted. Good luck. She said before continuing laughing. When she said that, the man outside shattered the window with his sledgehammer before climbing in and walking towards me. I turned to run away but tripped over the sofa. I got up quickly but not quick enough. The man was already on my tail and had struck me in the leg with the hammer. The old woman snickered upon hearing a slight pop in my leg. The sharp pain didn't stop me from dashing my way around the man. Before jumping the window, he just shattered, limping my way across the yard. Jerry's shop was closed, of course, but I planned on breaking in to get what I needed. There was no time to wait until the shop opened the next day. I was hoping Jerry hadn't sold all the jewelry yet. I went to the side of the building and busted out one of the windows with a brick I found lying nearby before climbing in. I made my way through the dim shop and peered inside of the showcases to see if I could spot some of the jewelry lying inside. There was no sign of any of it. Afterwards, I went to the back room. As soon as I stepped in, an alarm went off through the entire shop. Must have tripped a sensor somewhere. I forgot all about Jerry's security system. At that moment, I had even less time to find what I needed. I rambled through several drawers and small compartments, then found a small pile of gold necklaces and bracelets, but none of them was what I was looking for. I even checked Jerry's office. After all that searching, I still came up with nothing. When I stepped out of Jerry's office, I saw the man standing in the doorway. That was strange because I didn't hear anyone come in, but it was too late to hide and the back room was pretty small and narrow. There was no way I was going to get around him that time. I turned and took off, busting through the emergency exit behind me. Then I turned and slammed the door in the man's face. He started banging on the door and did that for minutes. I was surprised these guys couldn't open a simple door but had the instinct to use weapons such as guns. But before taking off, I noticed something lying on top of one of the dumpsters. To me, it looked like a pair of legs. I walked to the back of the dumpster and saw just that. A pair of human legs, wearing worn out blue jeans and black boots. But the person's torso, along with the rest of their body, was missing. Entrails spilled out from the top. My eyes grew watery when I noticed the wallet chain hanging out of one of the pockets. After seconds of staring at the legs in sheer shock, they toppled over and fell to the ground, some of the bloody intestines splattering across the pavement. I twitched in fear and stepped back. I saw something fall out of one of the pants pockets and hit the ground. A small piece of gold jewelry. After moving in closer, I discovered a ring. That's when I hear the sound of the door being forced open. The man turned and spotted me right away. That's when I picked up the ring and placed it on my finger. He came and stood right next to me, standing only inches away. I expected him to strike me with the hammer at any second, but he didn't. He just stared, looking into my soul with those charcoal eyes. At that moment, I saw what the jewelry was really capable of. I saw a wisp of flashing light hit the wall behind the man. I spun around to see two police cruisers coming down the road leading to the pawn shop. I ran to the front of the store and stood in the parking lot with my hands in the air waiting for them to turn in. As soon as the officers stepped out of their cars, they drew their pistols and yelled at me to get down on the ground. I complied while desperately trying to tell them that it wasn't what it looked like. They wouldn't listen so I had no choice but to let them handcuff and throw me into the back of one of the cruisers. One of the officers drove me away from the scene. As we pulled off, I could see the man on the side of the building, watching me ride further away from a distance. 
Now fast forward over 10 years later. I'm in my early 30s and I got my GED along with a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity. I'm now a security analyst at a consulting firm with a very stable source of income. Life has actually been fairly decent for me thus far, although my chances of a better life came close to being ruined earlier on. After the police had taken me into custody, they kept me there all night after interrogating the hell out of me. They knew I broke into the shop. Several of our neighbors at our apartment complex called the police after they heard the gunshot in our apartment. They visited our apartment and found Chris's body. Then the next day they discovered Mike and his girlfriend. My fingerprints were found all over the woman's house and the pawn shop where they found half of Jerry's body. To this day they still haven't found his torso. The amount of murder accusations that came after was endless. They were determined to get a confession out of me. I tried telling them that there was someone after me, but I didn't say a word about the curse and the black-eyed men. Fortunately, they were unable to press in many charges due to an insufficient amount of evidence. There were fingerprints, but nothing really pointing to murder. The only thing I was charged with was breaking and entering. The case of my dead friends and Mike's girlfriend has been cold ever since, and they've been on the hunt for a murderer that technically doesn't exist. As for the curse, well, Caitlin's sister was right. I still remain marked to this day. The black-eyed men still follow me everywhere I go. I'll see slight glimpses of them throughout every day, only to turn and find nothing there. My co-workers think I'm insane when I get jumpy and paranoid at the office. I've discovered that I'm the only one who can see the black-eyed men. At night, things get real. I mean, really real. Nightmares aren't a big thing anymore, though they still occur frequently. But the black-eyed men sure do make up for the torment that the nightmares have lacked. I have to keep my doors shut at night because if I don't shut my door, the men will enter my room and stare at me. They'll stand outside of my bedroom door and bang on it continuously. I'll occasionally end up pulling an all-nighter not only because of the constant noise, but the amount of terror that will build up inside of me while it's happening. Sometimes I swear I'm just one heartbeat away from my chest exploding. To make matters worse, they've started mimicking voices of people I once knew. Mostly Chris and Mike on the other side of the door trying desperately to convince me to remove my ring. Come on, Ken. Just take off the ring and I promise life will get much better for you. One of the men said in Chris's voice. When I ignore them, they get agitated and belligerent. For fuck's sake, Kenny. I heard Mike's voice. Stop being a hard ass and just take that piece of shit off your hand. Speaking of Chris and Mike... Something rang a bell in my mind a few years back. Chris had constant pain in his jaw for days, before having dreams of the black-eyed men stomping him in the face, in the jaw. Then finally one of the black-eyed men blew his jaw off in real life. Then Mike, on the other hand, had headaches so bad that he had to take off from work. Then he dreamt of being bashed in the head with a rock. The sledgehammer guy gave him a similar fate in reality. Now this has me wondering, is it really possible to keep running away from the curse forever? With some jewelry? Does the curse have someone's fate sealed the moment they take ownership of it? The ring that seems to be saving my ass right now. Is it all just temporary after all? Is there something Caitlin's sister left out and didn't tell me? The fact that I felt pain all over my body. My nightmare was having every limb and possibly every other bone in my body being broken to the extreme. What's that supposed to mean? When I was young, dolls used to petrify me to such an extent that I couldn't even do simple things like go to the bathroom if one were near me. But it wasn't just because I didn't like the way they looked. No, 
It was because they would come alive whenever I was alone with them. I remember when it first happened. My mother had received this pair of dolls from one of her work friends. Two Indian dolls. One was slightly bigger than the other and I hated them the moment I laid eyes on them. My mother bought this small rocking chair that the bigger one could sit in. And the smaller one was able to sit on the other's lap. How I loathe those dolls. Anyway, cut forward a couple days and my mom was gone at work while I stayed home to watch the house. We had two dogs, but for whatever reason, they didn't seem to realize nor care about what was happening. I was sitting in the living room watching TV when I thought I saw the bigger of the two dolls move. They were sitting on the mantle in front of the wood stove and my adolescent eyes caught the slight movement of its plastic head. I was, of course, terrified but also curious as to if my phobia was just causing me to see things that weren't really happening. I stared into the doll's glossy eyes and watched without blinking for any other signs of movement, but there were none. That is, until I was about to look away. As my eyes drifted back towards the TV, I could have sworn I saw the doll's eyes blink. What need would dolls have for blinking fake eyes? What would have been a thought of mine now, but... Then, as a kin, it never really crossed my mind. Nevertheless, my heart skipped a beat as my gaze returned to the bigger of the two dolls. It didn't move again that day, and by the time night fell, I had almost completely forgotten about it. That night, I slept peacefully, completely without incident. But the next day was something else entirely. Once again, my mother was gone at work, and I was in the basement on the computer. The computer desk sat against the wall that placed you facing the opposite direction of the stairs. I often played games for hours at that desk while I awaited my mother's return. But that day, something nightmarish occurred. While I was sitting at the desk, I heard a strange clicking sound. I thought it may have been one of the dogs upstairs. Their nails often made a clicking noise against the wood flooring of the kitchen when they walked to their water bowls so I ignored it. Besides, the house was older, and there were plenty of indescribable sounds that happened daily. Then, I heard the brushing of an object against the carpet of the basement. I swiftly spun around in the computer chair, hoping to see that my mother had snuck down the stairs. Instead, I caught a glimpse of a tiny moccasin disappearing behind the pool table. At first, my mind didn't, or rather, couldn't register what I had seen. Maybe I didn't see anything at all. For whatever reason, I decided for the latter and turned back around in my chair, simply ignoring the oddity I had just experienced. I was a kid, after all, and that kind of imaginative stuff came and went like the wind. I went back to playing my game, not a care in the world. I had probably seen the cat or something. He wasn't the sociable type, but sometimes he would come out and watch me do stuff when I was at the computer. Good old Smokey. Anyway, I played on without worry. Soon I realized I had completely failed to check the time. It was getting quite late, and my mother still wasn't home. Where is she? I wondered, but then I heard it again. That strange clicking noise like someone tapping against glass, only this time, it was right next to my ear. When I turned to look, there, sat on an amplifier for a guitar, was the bigger doll. It wasn't looking at me, not at first anyway. It was staring at my computer screen. Its eyes were unnaturally realistic, almost like they were human eyes. I froze in place with my eyes fixated on the patterns of its cloth dress. It was just sitting there. No movement, but I was too afraid to do anything about it, at least until its head turned in my direction. Those bloodshot eyes were piercingly horrific. I admit I yelled, maybe even screamed. I can't remember. I only remember jolting out of the chair and sprinting for the staircase, nearly tripping over a cat toy in the process. 
and when I attempted to climb the stairs, it was like when you have a dream where you move like you're stuck in mud. I fell to my hands and knees and dragged myself up them, one step at a time. I felt as though I was being pulled the opposite way, being paralyzed by the mere presence of this sinister doll. I looked down the stairs and it wasn't there. Maybe I had imagined the whole thing, but then a shadow appeared. The small but looming shadow slowly approaching the base of the stairs and suddenly the doll's small head, fitted with jet black hair, appeared around the corner inching ever closer to the first step. I thought I was done for. I couldn't move fast enough and this menacing little thing was crawling quicker than I thought possible. It got closer and closer to my feet. Then it said something. A doll's stomach is bigger than you think. Its voice was like one of those pull string doll voices and I nearly passed out from the shock. I couldn't get away. What are you doing? Came a familiar voice. The voice of my mother. She was standing at the top of the stairs and when I looked back in the direction of the doll, it was laying at the bottom of the stairs. My mother was as concerned as any parent would be, but she seemed more interested into why the doll was downstairs and not on the mantel. I told her what had happened, but she obviously didn't believe me. And it got to the point where I wasn't sure if I believed it either. But then, more things started to happen. The next occurrence. I was in the shower. I heard the door open with a hair-raising creak, and unfortunately the curtain wasn't one that allowed you even a modicum of visibility to the other side. I stood still and listened, but no further noise invaded my privacy. I thought, maybe the dog is just curious. Although, I could have sworn I closed the door all the way. Regardless, I started to wash the soap out of my eyes, and after I had finished, I looked down near the faucet to be met with a sight that almost caused me to slip and fall. Peering in at me, from the corner of the shower curtain was the little doll. It giggled like a child and scurried away like a rat. I didn't hear the door close, but I remained in the shower holding both ends of the curtain tight until my mother got home. Luckily, she had only gone to the store, so I wasn't in there long. I was becoming increasingly worried. I even started having nightmares. Horribly twisted visions of dolls in every room of the house chasing me to no end. Things only got worse from there. I was laying in bed one night, unable to sleep. Every sound startled me, sometimes even my own breathing. I resorted to pinning my face against the wall and using a small hole for fresh air. That's how scared I was. I finally managed to get tired enough to fall asleep, reaching the point of total exhaustion that forced my eyes to close whether I wanted them to or not. When I relinquished my faculties over to slumber, I rolled over onto my back, but my bare skin felt not the comfort of my mattress because the sensation under me was hard like plastic. I didn't even get a chance to react before something bit into my shoulder with immense force, and I cried out in pain. Only then did I hear the malevolent sound of giggling coming from my bed, and when I jumped up and turned the light on, there it was. The little doll flapped against my mattress. I shouted for my mother and when she flew into my room with a righteous fury for having been woken up, the doll was as dormant as ever. Stop playing these games. She shouted at me and when I showed her the bite mark she claimed that I had just scratched myself too hard in my sleep. I didn't know what else to do. Even when I would go to my father's, his styrofoam heads would roll into my room at night and nip at my ankles like hungry piranhas. But he never believed me. Bug bites, he'd say, and it was always my word against his. I told everyone I knew about what was happening to me, but not one person took me serious. Whenever I was in a room with a doll, I could feel its intensely negative energy, oppressing my every emotion. Its eyes would watch me as I walked, but no one else seemed to notice. It got to the point where I had enough. One night, 
I grabbed the two dolls in my mother's house and threw them outside into the ill moonlight. After which I grabbed a shovel and buried them deep underground for kids' standards. The whole time they were laughing and saying, We love the taste of your blood. And, don't worry, we'll make sure you're never alone again. I wasn't worried about being alone. I just didn't want to be plagued by these diabolical entities any longer. My mother questioned me the next day, wondering why I had dirt under my fingernails and if it had anything to do with those dolls. But I said the dogs must have done it. Sorry, pups. By the will of something equally as foreign to me as this phenomena with the dolls, my mother believed me and that was that. Three days came and went, and I was starting to feel like I was free of this horrendous anomaly. That is, until the fourth night. I was laying in bed, much like the time before when I heard a curious, but infernally familiar sound of clicking or tapping against glass. I didn't have to think for long to me to know it was coming from my bedroom window. I stood up carefully and slowly and creeped my way over to that potential frame into hell. I lightly and cautiously gripped the edge of the curtain and pulled it away just enough to see out of the window. But it wasn't a matter of me looking out of the window. It was a matter of the demonic, bigger doll staring back at me with the froth pouring out of its all too realistic mouth. I reeled away from the window and gasped. My breathing became rapid and short, and my nerves turned to ice. The tapping continued. I even heard the giggling that I assumed was coming from the smaller doll from somewhere outside. They must have unearthed themselves, although taking a while to do so. Obviously, I was horrified. I wasn't even able to cry out in terror. I was like an image frozen in time. A still frame depicting a boy within mere inches from the grasp of his lifelong fear. To make matters worse, the doll at the window began whispering with a guttural, almost gravelly voice. We just want another taste. I didn't know what to do or say, so I instead, I left my cowardice consume me, and I bundled up in my blankets in the corner of my bed. I didn't sleep much that night, and my mother could tell because she asked me about it the next morning. What's wrong? She asked sweetly, but with a hint of scrutiny. I had a nightmare, Mama. I remember saying, although it could have been different. The dolls again? She inquired in the mere words, sent a shockwave down my spine. Y yes, Mom. I had a dream that they were at my window trying to get in. Honey, that's an awful dream, but you must know, dolls aren't real. Well, living ones aren't. You have nothing to be afraid of. Her smile at the end was reassuring. If only she knew that the dolls were staring right at me during the entire conversation from the kitchen window behind her. Eventually, I had to start a routine of making sure all doors were locked every time I was alone. Or if anyone wasn't in a room with me. It went on like that for quite some time, and for the most part, nothing disturbing happened, apart from them being at my window every single night. But not all things always go as planned. I began to wonder as to why these two particular dolls had it out for me. The styrofoam heads at my father's house didn't seem to follow me further than the front door, but these two, they were different, and unfortunately for me, they were smart. One fateful and regrettable night, I had been falling asleep in the car coming back from visiting my aunt's house. I awoke in my bed later on and it wasn't because of tapping on the glass. It was because of the slight pressure I was feeling on my chest. I opened my eyes, only a crack and saw both dolls sitting on my body as my mother would have placed them in the rocking chair on the mantel. Their eyes were glowing like a hellish wildfire, or even of that of a demon. I tried my absolute best not to alter my breathing or to make any kind of change that would notify them of my being awake, and I swallowed a massive lump in my throat. 
to this day. I cannot forget the words uttered by the bigger of the two dolls that night. We know you're awake. Followed by more childish giggling by the smaller doll. I still didn't move. I knew I was sweating and visibly so. But I just couldn't will myself to get up. However, my mother, bless her heart, saved me. Without warning, she burst into my room and turned the light on. The two dolls went limp on my chest like some twisted version of Toy Story, and my mother, of course, immediately noticed them. I thought you said the dogs did something with these. She asked with a strangely aggressive curiosity. Mom, these dolls are trying to hurt me. They scare me. Please take them away. I vividly remember my plea to her. I came in here because I heard giggling. She exclaimed as she peered around the room. It was the doll, Mama. The smaller one. She looked at me and to this day, I believe she must have seen the absolute fear in my eyes because she quickly snatched them up and took them away. Nothing more happened that night. The next day I asked her what she did with them and she said, I took them to the landfill this morning, sweetheart. They had always creeped me out since they were given to me, so it was easy to get rid of them. Oh, okay, was all I remember saying. And from that point on, there was never another incident. Yes, dolls still came alive, but they were never as malicious as those two were. It's been years and years since then. I've mostly been able to avoid coming into contact with anything inanimate or doll-like, and I've even found some of the ones weren't hostile to me. I asked my mother why she didn't get rid of them sooner, after the bite incident and she's son. My friend, the woman who gave them to me, passed away shortly after and I didn't want to just toss her gift out. However, I always hated their eyes. They seemed... too real. I agreed with her and went about my day after that. Tonight, 18 years later, I still have the phobia of anything resembling a human in nature, but is inanimate, i.e. dolls. I've been able to maintain a level of composure despite this fear and the strange thing that happens to any doll I'm alone in a room or otherwise with. But lately, as of the last few nights, I've been hearing tapping on the window of the bedroom in my home. I'm much too afraid to get up and look outside and a part of me wonders if it was a tiny moccasin I saw earlier out of the corner of my eye disappearing behind the couch instead of an odd shadow. I won't tell you anything more about my phobia, but I will say this. I just heard a voice coming from outside my window. It sounds like one of those old, pull-string toy voices. It said, We could never forget the way your blood tasted. My grandfather was a caretaker at Belmont Park Cemetery in Liberty, Ohio, right outside the city of Youngstown. It was a job my father had secured for him so he could be closer to all his boys, all five of them. My father came from a family of eight, three girls and five boys, my mother an only child. Now my grandfather was a retired coal miner from Welch, West Virginia. He eventually succumbed to black lung in his later years and was laid next to my grandmother to rest at Belmont Park. But that's a few years down the road yet, and not the story I want to tell here. My story takes place in the year of my country's bicentennial. I can still remember all the red, white, and blue, stickers, buttons, banners, and flags, plastered, painted, and taped all across my hometown of Liberty. I was 10 that summer, and more than just a little excited about it all. Let's not forget the parade. Like I said earlier, my grandfather was a caretaker cutting the grass and performing maintenance at the cemetery when needed. We lived on West Montrose. The road was a 90 degree angle and came to a dead end. There was a small trail that ran through the woods at the end of this road and came out at the north end of the cemetery. 
Now, Belmont Park is an average-sized cemetery as far as cemeteries go. It's sat on a slight grade with four pretty good-sized drainage ponds and two huge walk-in mausoleums which sat at the base of these grades. In the summer, they would open up the huge brass and wood doors and let the air out. My sister and I, and some of our friends from the neighborhood, and sometimes even our cousins when they were visiting, would walk down these old musty halls, taking turns reading, aloud to each other, the names, birth, and death dates etched into the marble faces. And sometimes, on dark, spooky summer nights, we would sneak into the cemetery with flashlights and take etchings off the older gravestones with crayons and paper. Not to make it sound creepy, but the cemetery was at the end of our road. My grandfather worked there, so it was kind of a place for us kids to hang out at when there was nothing else to do. Not to mention there were sunfish in these ponds. Now, I would go up and fish these ponds or explore the surrounding woods that the cemetery ran up against. Or just sit with my grandfather while he took his lunch breaks and told me stories about my father and my uncles when they were young boys and full of mischief. It was the summer of 76 and I was happy to be out of school. This is a true story, by the way. Now, there had been a bad storm which had gone on most of the night and into the early hours of the morning. By 4 or 5 that morning, the storm had moved in. The day was still gray and overcast and there was some debris and a few branches that the weather had brought down and blown around, but other than that, it was over. I decided I was going fishing. I grabbed my pole and a few pieces of bread for bait. The sunfish loved it. I made my way to the end of our road, followed the path that led through the woods, and came out at the cemetery. As you came out of the woods, you come to the first of the drainage ponds, which is the largest of the four, and the best one for fishing. It also had three or four weeping willow trees around the water's edge that provided nice shade in the summer heat. I walked down the embankment to the edge of the pond, got my pole ready, and began to fish. Now I had cast my line in several times, and was getting no bites. As I had said earlier, there was a storm that had raged most of the evening, and into the early morning, and there were some sticks and branches lying around the edge of the pond. Since the fishing was no good that morning, I started to play around the water's edge, snapping off small sections of the sticks and pushing them out into the water, pretending I was launching ships. I had just launched about a two-foot section of a branch out into the pond when this hand, yes, a hand, dark and mottled, no more than half of it breaking the surface had gently stopped the stick and pushed it back towards me. Now you might think you can prepare yourself for the sight of something that in no way should be there, or to brush up against the unreal. Your ego might get big and say to your conscience that this is how I would react to a paranormal experience. I'm here to tell you right now when true terror grips you, you are like a deer frozen in the headlights of madness reeling until your mind finds purchase. Your mind is screaming no way, but your eyes are saying right there it is. I came to from my shock as the hand slowly slid under the surface of the water and the stick was on its way back towards me. At that instant, I realized how close I was to the water's edge and an entirely new wave of terror swept over me. What if it was making its way to the shore right now? quietly cutting through the muddy storm waters to grab me by my ankles and pull me in. I fell backwards and backpedaled. Crab walked up the embankment at a hundred miles an hour. I scrambled to my feet and stood there watching the surface where the hand had retreated, but it did not make a second appearance. One sighting was quite enough. I watched as the stick came back and made contact with the shore. That was enough for me. I grabbed my fishing pole and started back towards the trail, which led home. While quickly stealing glances over my shoulder to make sure I wasn't being followed, when I got home, I told my parents what I had seen at the cemetery, but they didn't believe me. Just like most of you reading this right now, 
it's like anything. I seen a ghost. I seen a UFO. I seen Bigfoot. People look at you and they don't know what to make of your story. But 9 out of 10 times, they just don't believe you. I know what I saw. So many times I tried to rationalize it over the years and have tried repeatedly to convince myself that it was just a tangle of sticks barely submerged under the surface of the water and that when my branch passed over it, it triggered the whole mass into motion. Like some nightmarish Rube Goldberg contraption that assembled itself and caused it to come to the surface for four or five seconds and then as gravity took over, it descended and pushed the stick back towards me and gave me this false impression of something being playful with me under the surface of the water that day. I'm in my mid-fifties and I want to put this down before I get too old. Not a month goes by that I don't think about what I saw on that overcast morning in the summer of 76. My children have made me tell them this story a thousand times on dark nights around our many campfires. So many years have passed since that summer morning. And the man in the mirror is no longer that little boy. And yet the man is still very sure of what his younger self witnessed that gray summer morning. But there's also this little itch in the back of my brain that I can't ignore that just won't go away no matter how ridiculous it sounds. That likes to remind me that the children's section of the cemetery sits just above my favorite fishing spot. And maybe... Just maybe I had a playmate that day who slid down through the ground to play with me. Who knows? I like to think on bright moonlit nights when all the conditions are right and the stars are hung just so. They slip out at the sides or base of their rotted caskets, moving like wet eels down those mud tubes, slipping silently into the pond to play with each other quietly laughing and raising light ripples, scattering the moonlight across its surface. The letter came for me in the middle of the night. The thunk of the letterbox opening interrupted my insomniac pacing echoing ominously through the empty hallways. I crept towards the door, knife in hand raised towards an unexpected intruder. The porch, however, was as empty as it always has been. All that remained of any foreign presence was a singular sheet of parchment lying face down on my carpet. The color of pale bone. I didn't even realize what it was until I picked it up, feeling the words etched into its surface drive the air from my lungs like a vicious punch to the gut. Dear Amir, you have been invited to find your soulmate. That's all it said. Ten simple words, yet each of them hammered an iron stake deep into the recesses of my heart. The letter slipped through the edges of my shaking fingers, gliding through the air back to its original position on the doormat. Its glossy edge shimmered in an otherworldly hue under the dim porch lamp, its hollow purple lettering staring back through me. Why had I received this? My mind raced with a thousand thoughts, none of them making the slightest sense. For the words on the letter were not foreign to me. I had heard about them, as all of us had. Even if I had never cast my eyes upon their physical form, engraved onto that fateful parchment, they were always spoken about in celebratory tones. Their arrival excitedly whispered over coffee by their giddy recipients for it promised an end to their fruitless searches for happiness. It was the one thing that provided absolute certainty in this world, that required nothing more than a drop of blood to guarantee eternal martial bliss. The problem was, I was already married. You don't have to open it, you know. Nothing's forcing you to do it. My gaze was fixed on the floor. My mind lesions away. The words washed over me, barely registering in my mind. Genuinely, Amir, just think about the entire thing rationally for a moment. Leonard placed a hand on the small of my back, letting its gentle pressure ease me upwards. Obviously, most people rip open the letter as soon as it comes. Who wouldn't want to be with the one you're destined to love for eternity? 
all without the myriad pitfalls of pain and false hope that usually plague the journey there. It's the opium craved by those who are alone in this world, but you are not alone. And you don't need this letter to know the name of your soulmate because you are already with her. There's nothing stopping you from simply letting the letter expire. I can't. It came for a reason. The words were stuck to the roof of my mouth. It always does. It means that the universe has something important to tell you. That the one for you is still out there. Everyone knows that. No one knows anything. That's all just speculation and hearsay. We don't even know who sends these letters. For all we know, it's a purely random process that you are ascribing meaning to. Those who are single rip it up immediately, but those who are married simply throw it away. That's not true. Look at Bennett, Chantel, Cynthia. They were all engaged, married even, yet they still receive the letter and their relationships promptly crumbled within the day. Yeah, but all three of them were absolutely miserable, remember? Don't you recall those tense dinners with Bennett's fiance, or how Cynthia's husband used to call her every 10 minutes when she was out with us? Their relationships were toxic sinkholes that they should have escaped a long time ago. All the letters did was give them the impetus to finally stand up for themselves for once in their lives. That could be me too, I mumbled. Oh, come on, Amir. Stop moping around. You and Rui are like salt and pepper. Have you seen your face when she enters the room? It lights up like the rising sun, and when you're around, she gets so giddy she can barely speak. You found what people spend their whole lives searching for, and you don't need some magical blood contract to tell you that. My head bobbed up and down like a fish hook. Rui's face, frightfully attractive, floated into my mind. Her eyes, so genuine and full of warmth, gazed into the depths of my soul. Her lips, the color of pink bubblegum, whispered the ten words we held locked in our hearts. I am yours, and you are mine, now and forever. Yet instead of echoing them proudly, I found the words drying up in my throat. Cowering in shame at my duplicity and her deep brown eyes fractured into deep disappointment. Leonard was right. I knew that. I couldn't betray the woman I love like this. My mind knew that. Yet why were my hands still reaching back into my pocket, unfolding the crumpled parchment back between my fingers? I clenched my fists, hating myself, but my irises continued boring a hole through the letter. Leonard watched me with a sigh. Fine, tell you what. Maybe we're looking at this the wrong way. Maybe you should just open it. He shrugged his shoulders. After all, what's the worst that could happen? If it turns out to be Rui, well then that's perfect. You know for certain that she's the one for you, forever and always. If it's somehow someone else, then your marriage was destined to fade away. All you would be doing is accelerating the inevitable process of its slow disintegration. Save both of you the long, drawn-out pain of trying to rescue the Titanic with a bucket. I remained silent for a long while. Finally, I spoke. I can't. You can't what? I can't lose her. Not again. Again? When have you broken up with her? I looked at him and he knew. Aw, oh, shit. Yeah. I nodded somberly, biting my lip. A river of pain was coming. I could feel it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have brought it up. My forehead tightened as my heart squeezed inside my chest. Images lashed into my mind unbidden, even as I tried to look away. Hollow blue marbles stared back at me through lifeless sockets. A quivering knife buried itself far deep in blood-soaked flesh. An old familiar stench filled my nose. Those horrible fumes from the parts of a person's body that were never meant to be exposed to the world. The memories were drowning me. Too hard, too fast. What if I lose Rui as well? I struggled to keep control of my breath. 
How do I know that the universe hasn't destined her to be just another passing blip in my life, just as Aubrey was? Amir, I'm really sorry, but that was a freak tragedy. A once-in-a-lifetime incident of extraordinarily bad luck. Aubrey just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's not going to happen again. His sentences tumbled out erratically, grasping for the right words to paper over the cracks of my heart. Don't let that taint your marriage. Before this ridiculous paper came, had the thought of losing Rui ever crossed your mind? No, I suppose not. But aren't we always blinded by love? Too absorbed in the shallow beauty right before us to recognize the alarms blaring inches away? I love Rui to the depths of my soul. I love her so much that my heart aches. But I felt this way about Aubrey too. Once upon a time. The air hung heavy between us. The pauses in our senses suffocating us in their weighty embrace. I can see now that she wasn't the one for me. That I had been overlooking signs that should have been obvious. But in the moment, when she was still breathing and warm in my arms... I could see nothing else. She was my world, my anchor, and only having her wrenched away from me showed me otherwise. Even now, her whispers haunt my nightmares. I can't let the same thing happen again. It would break me. Leonard's lips parted, attempting to form the sounds of a reply, but all they found was thin air and empty platitudes and his lips sealed shut, joining my gaze riveted in the asphalt, letting the day pass us by. I stared numbly at the pale parchment, feeling its edges shift under my touch like sand blowing through the wind. The words were already growing faint, their dark pigments evaporating into the atmosphere. 24 hours. That was all I had to make a decision. Let that window lapse, and I would never know what was written within. The wallpaper of my bedroom seemed to flicker under the dim light of the setting sun, my addled mind swirling its pattern into Rui's smile, the same one that had settled onto her face under the waterfall in Tuscany. Her features melted against the stream of water cascading down, her golden laughter sparkling against the gurgling flow. I took a deep breath and reached for the match by my side feeling its flames lap against my thumb as I struck it. My arm forced itself towards the letter, but my hand refused to obey, letting the fire flicker uselessly centimeters away from the parchment. Finally, it died, snuffed out by a passing gust, and I threw the match on the floor in disgust, reuniting it with an army of its cousins, strewn in an untidy mound by my shoe. I couldn't do it. Why couldn't I fucking do it? My entire arm shook uncontrollably, clenching and unclenching my fist as I rocked back and forth. The slamming of a distant door frame snapped me out of my reverie. Really, she was home. A smile hovered on the edges of my lips, but the drought of happiness I expected to come was swiftly extinguished by a cold shock of dread. Its taste bitter on my tongue. Was this how I would feel for the rest of my life? Forever holding myself back, plagued by the thought that she might not be the one, could I ever lose myself in her arms again, my mind free from the lingering doubt of that, but how was I supposed to live like this? No, I had to know. My hand snapped into action, suddenly given clearance to do what they had been aching to for so long. An old safety pin uncovered itself from beneath a pile of sewing equipment, finding itself between my fingers. Its pointed edge found resistance against the tip of my index finger, digging in tediously until it finally broke through, releasing a lone droplet of crimson onto the middle of the parchment. It remained coagulated momentarily before bursting out into the surrounding space. Dendritic tendrils rapidly fanning out through the entire sheet. Footfalls thunderous against the carpeted stairs. Grew louder and louder as the liquid swallowed up the rest of the paper. The spidery words faded into the backdrop as the blood swirled. 
darkening in the middle to reveal bolded letters. Just as they were about to complete their arrangement, the door crashed open and my head snapped upward towards my wife. Honey, what are you? Her breath strangled itself in her throat, a choked gasp replacing the words that had been forming. I'm sorry, I blurted out with a sob. I just had to know. My eyes strayed from her face, drawn inexorably downwards and towards the letter clasped between the shuddering hands. Rui Min Cheng. My gaze remained locked on the paper, my mind a blank. It was her. It was her. My heart, heavy as a stone, suddenly felt light as a feather and I laughed. The shackle around my chest released its grip as I rolled back towards her, but the sight of those beautiful eyes stricken by a ghostly horror sent me crashing back down to earth. A knife thrust deep in the shackle's place, and I was overcome by the irresistible urge to sink endlessly into the ground. I, I can explain. I had to... needed to know. I don't know why, but I couldn't stop myself. Please, Rui. You have to understand. Her cheeks, once as rosy as two balls of sunshine, had been drained of all color. The assured gaze of a woman's confident in her husband's faithfulness had shattered, her pallid lips no longer responding to the signals of her face. I stepped towards her, but she took two steps back, grasping at the door frame with trembling fingers and a whimper. Are you... Are you okay? I frowned. This wasn't right. Wasn't she furious? Why wasn't she saying anything? Why wasn't she shouting at me? That's when I realized she wasn't angry. She was terrified. I gasped at her, struggling to figure out what was going on. I felt movement in my hands, and as I glanced downwards, I realized that the entire parchment had shrunk, folding upon itself until it was a fraction of its original size. Instead of delicate paper, it had hardened into a robust mineral, its cream and purple glimmer now accentuated and deepened with a distinctive oval shape I had seen every day for the last six years. It was the shape of the pendant around her neck. Time seemed to slow around me as my world reeled. I could see nothing else except the pendant hovering above the contours of her collarbone, matching the one in my hand perfectly. How had I not noticed that the colors were exactly the same? My hands reached towards her necklace and she recoiled backwards with a cry, dodging the direction of my thrust. Her face was streaked with tears, the corner of her eyes blood red. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Her hand flailed limply in the air, seeking purchase and certainty that were no longer there. This wasn't supposed to happen. It couldn't have happened. You... You received the same letter. I did. It's how I found you. You weren't meant to find out. Not like this. The air between us hung taut, frigid as a block of ice. The lines of her face creased downwards, revealing an age to her that I had never noticed before. Her chest quivered desperately as she choked back sobs, her coffee-tinted eyes fixed upon me, urgent and pleading. I stared at her, open-mouthed, feeling the seconds tick by. Then a solitary breath escaped my lips. Another came more easily this time until it morphed into a strange sound that faintly resembled a giggle. Do you remember those old movie stunts by Charlie Chaplin? She stared back at me. You know, the ones where he would hang off the edge of a building for dear life for hours, but when he finally falls he lands flat on his feet and you realize that the precipice was all just an illusion. I... I don't know. Look, what I'm trying to say is, 
When you said that you had received a soulmate letter with my name on it, I was surprised. Stunned, even. But you know what? That's all I feel. I realize that I don't care. The air soared through my lungs. Rich and alive. And my voice had taken on a pitch I never knew it could reach. What does it matter how you found me? When it doesn't change the fact that we are destined for each other. Now and forever. I closed the distance between us and kissed her deeply. Feeling the warm curves of her lips press against my mouth. Her eyes blinked with surprise, but in a second her tears evaporated, replaced by bubbling laughter, echoing through me like an aria as I held her close, her heartbeat merging with mine. We tumbled onto the couch like a pair of giddy lovers, our laughter joyous and full. Hours must have passed before we realized we hadn't moved. We lay on the couch tangled in each other's embrace. I stroked her jet black hair, caressing the curls of her locks, as luscious as they had been on the night of our first date. Her face had regained its divine serenity, the porcelain glow of her features radiating through me. She snuggled up close, pulling a blanket over us. It seems crazy, doesn't it? There I was all of yesterday, losing my mind over whether to open the letter, when in fact you had already done so years ago. Rui caressed my cheek gently. You've always stressed yourself too much for your own good. That overactive imagination of yours is your worst enemy. Can you blame me? I thought I was going to lose you forever. She laughed. You silly boy. You'd have to try far harder than that to get rid of me. We lay there, letting the comforting silence wash over us, and I felt my entire body uncoil itself. I gazed upwards towards the ceiling, a soothing smile falling upon my face. For the first time in a long while, I breathed. There's still something I don't understand. I uncurled one of her locks lazily, letting it tangle around my finger. Hmm. She exhaled as she tilted her head slightly upward towards me. Why did I receive the letter if you already had it all those years ago? I've only ever heard of one person in a couple receiving it. Who knows? Additional confirmation, maybe. She buried her head against my chest, her eyes blinking close. Lots of people yearn for the letter, but so few actually get it. A bit of a waste, isn't it? For the letter to come for both of us? I never peg the universe as the frivolous sort. I suppose so. Her breathing had already settled into that familiar lull it took just as she was about to fall asleep. It's gentle rises and falls, inducing a yawn in me. I looked upwards towards the ceiling, feeling a deep sense of contentment settle over me. Maybe the universe was telling me something after all. It was telling me to cherish our love, reminding me that nothing can ever come close to matching it. Seems gratuitous if you ask me. She said with a drowsy laugh. We hardly needed any confirmation of that. We wouldn't be very good soulmates if we did. Besides, why wait seven years? I don't think anyone who commits to a relationship for that long needs some silly paper to tell them what they've made the right choice. I chuckled, but I found my laughter catching itself in my throat. A string pulled at me from the back of my mind, its thread tugging urgently at my consciousness, screaming at me to notice it. I played her words over in my head languidly, like a cat playing with a ball of yarn, when suddenly I froze. My head turned towards hers slowly, each muscle in my neck dragging the movement out as long as possible. What did you say? Hmm. What did you say just now? About that silly piece of paper? No, after that. About how long the letter took to arrive. My head was pounding, nearly drowning out her voice with the thumps racketing through my brain. Oh, yes, yeah, seven years is a long delay. But we only met six years ago. Her eyes fluttered open casually, but I felt her heart quicken against my chest. Oh, I suppose you're right. I got the years mixed up. 
We just celebrated our sixth anniversary a few weeks ago. You know that, I said slowly. Why would you say it's been seven years since you got the letter? It was just a mistake, she muttered softly. Really? My throat was constricting, each word a struggle. Familiar emotions, long buried but never forgotten, were knocking incessantly on my door. Look at me. Why did you say seven? When did you receive the letter? Her expression was blank, fixated on some faraway point in the room. A curious look, one I had never seen before, appeared to come over her face, replacing that doe-eyed expression I thought I knew so well. In the light, she looked like an entirely different person, and I tensed backwards, an eerie dread creeping up my spine. A shimmering glint within the, my pocket of my shirt caught my eye. As my trembling hands retrieved the hardened amulet, I realized that its purple swirls had reformed themselves into an inscription of today's date. Just under Rui's name, right under it, however, the strands of another were crystallizing, glinting far brighter than its counterpart. 23rd of January... 2015, the day before Aubrey was murdered. A cannonball blew through me, leaving a gaping hole where my heart had rested, and my entire body locked up, numb and paralyzed. All I could focus on was Rui's face, shadowed and unreadable, observing the floor wordlessly. Time seemed to have frozen around us, trapping the two of us in a portrait of screaming despair. Finally, she turned back towards me, the erstwhile stoicism in her features unfolding into a wolfish grin. She chuckled as she brushed her hair back over her ear, her eyes glinting with the manic light I had never seen before. Ah, oh, my sunshine. You know I've never been a patient one. Fate had already decided that we were meant to be together. Her face broke out into an iridescent smile, as bright as the one she had the first day I met her. I simply helped to hurry the process along 